We're here today with Wharton Professor of Practice David Robertson, author of the new book, Brick by Brick, How Lego Rewrote the Rules of Innovation and Conquered the Global Toy Industry. David, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, well, I had a chance to read the book, and the story of Lego's inception from a small company that just made wooden toys into kind of a worldwide giant is pretty interesting. Could you briefly discuss its origins? Sure. Uh, it was actually a failed carpenter. In 1932, uh, Denmark was in the midst of a recession like much of the world, and um, a carpenter named Ole Kirk Christensen was having trouble getting the wood he needed to make furniture. So he took scraps of wood and made toys for kids, um, which actually did pretty well. He turned that into a business and, and started Lego in 1932. And where did the iconic brick come from? Like, how did he go from wooden toys to the Lego that we kind of, to the toy that we kind of all identify Lego with? So, in, uh, so he, he makes wooden toys for the first 15 years of the business. Um, he's got four young boys, um, and actually his wife dies uh, a year or two after he starts the business. Um, and he continues to grow and do well. Um, and then in 1947, against the wishes of his then-grown sons, he invests in this really risky uh, technology called in plastic injection molding and starts making plastic toys, which initially do pretty badly. Um, there's a lot of uh, the department stores say that, the, who tell him that, that kids will never want um, toys made out of this cheap plastic stuff, that wooden toys is what kids will always want. Um, but he uh, uh, experiments with different types of plastic toys. He builds some stackable, although not really interlocking bricks, um, and then passes control of the, of the company to his son, uh, Godfrey Kirk Christensen, who experiments with different configurations and finally comes up with the interlocking brick with those studs and tubes um, and patents that in 1958. Um, along the way, uh, Godfrey does something really interesting. He, uh, he is talking to a, um, a department store owner from the major department store in Denmark. And the, the guy uh, tells him, he says, what we need is not another toy, but a system of play. Something where if you buy a second set, you don't add to your toys, you multiply what's possible. That these things can interlock and do, do um, you can do more, uh, much more as, as you buy more sets, that the opportunities multiply. And uh, Godfred Kirk Christensen, he uh, goes back and he looks at all the different things that he's um, offering. And he realizes that 90% of the things don't fall in this category of a system of play. And it really is only these stackable bricks that do. And so he makes a pretty big strategic decision to actually cut out 90% of his product inventory and focus on the brick. And that's a pretty big move, but turned out to be pretty successful. Right. I mean, I was really struck by, I mean, just this idea in that part of the book about how, you know, you, you know, you buy a package of Legos and it fits with all the other packages of Legos and it doesn't matter if you're combining pieces from the space set with pieces from the castle set. I mean, what do you think, I mean, what are some of the key decisions in Lego's early years that kind of stand out to you for instrumenting the firm's initial success and also where maybe other firms could take the, be the, the lessons from? Well, I think one of the early decisions that um, really made a huge difference was the development of the minifigure. Back in 1978, the first of these little Lego people uh, came out. And, and that really took the whole idea of a system of play to a new level. That before 1978, um, I have a picture in the book of three different really popular sets from the mid-70s. One is a family, and they stand about 10 bricks tall. And then next to them is a train, which stands about eight bricks tall, but there's no way the family could fit in the train. And then next to them is a house, which stands about five or six bricks tall. And so that the family is towering over, like some 50s monster movie is towering over this house. Um, and so the, there's some good toys in the 70s, but they weren't at the same scale at all. When, um, when the, the Lego uh, company comes out with the minifigure, they standardize all the sets around that scale. And so they make the, the system of play um, even more of a system. And that's when things really start to take off for the company. Uh, from 78 through 93, the company grew at 14% per year every year for 15 years, basically doubling in size every five years for 15 years. And it was this kind of golden period in, in Lego's history where they expanded into North America and other, other geographies. Um, they explored different types of sets, so they did theme sets around space and castle and pirates and western. 
and uh, and everything worked for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, then comes Lego went through a decline in the 1990s and the 2000s. Now, there are plenty of stories out there about companies that, you know, they responded too late to changes that would significantly impact their business or how their customers lived. I mean, is that what happened with Lego or was there something different at work there when the company kind of experienced this decline? Yeah, there's two phases to that decline. Um, the first one was from 93 to 98. They went through this stagnant period where really they, they'd reached the end of a natural growth cycle. Um, they were, there, there's only so many feet of toy space and so many toy stores around the world, and Lego was on those shelves already, and so you know it, it, it kind of reached the end of a natural growth cycle. But what they did is to try and keep the growth going, they tripled the number of new toys that they offered between 93 and 98. Um, but sales didn't go anywhere. Costs, on the other hand, you can imagine if you triple your, your number of, of products without changing your sales, your costs go up, your profits go down, and they suffered the first loss in company history in 1998. So they lay off 1,000 people. The grandson of the founder, Kelkirk Christensen, who's now been leading the company for 20 years, he steps aside. He says, maybe I'm not the right person to lead this company in the next generation. He brings in a turnaround expert. That guy finishes the layoff. His name is Paul Plowman. And he realizes that Lego is actually operating in a very different world than, than it was just 10 years before that he goes out and he starts looking at the market and finds that kids are getting older, younger, um, that uh, the, the whole market for uh, toys has changed with um, companies like Toys R Us and Walmart being much more sophisticated, much more powerful in terms of their, their market power. And lastly, um, a lot of other toys had switched their production to China. Um, and so their toys, the other toys you could buy for your kids were getting cheaper. Lego, on the other hand, the Danish kroner had, had um, increased in value against the dollar, and Legos were still made in Denmark. And so Legos were getting more expensive while other, t- other toys were getting less expensive. It's kind of a double hit. And so the company realized that it, it, it really needed to do something different. And that's when they embarked on this this experiment with innovation. Right. And I mean, you, I think in the book you might refer to it as an innovation binge in a way that they came up with a lot of products that I guess, I mean, when I was reading about them, they seemed like they could be in a way like can't miss products. I mean, there was collaborations with Star Wars, with Harry Potter. There was some really innovating sounding work with computerizing the, the trademark blocks and kind of putting them into a virtual world. But where did the company go wrong? I mean, what was leadership missing when they were embarking on this you know, I mean, campaign of innovation. I mean, do you think they really could have seen the problems if they'd been paying attention to different things? Yeah, the, um, it, the short answer to that question is um, that they lost, they lost control of the innovation, that um, they tried to innovate in lots of different ways, and they did. They came out with a lot of different toys. Um, now, some of those toys were hits, um, like Lego Star Wars, Lego Harry Potter, Bionicle. There's a couple of really big hits. And in a way, those were really dangerous for Lego because they, they hid, uh, you know, we call in the book, the, it's a thick layer of cosmetics that hides some, a pretty ugly business underneath. Um, some of the other toys, um, there's a toy called uh, Explore. It was a line of toys for toddlers. And they were actually pretty good toys, in, you know, just from my, my point of view. Um, but they weren't very Lego-y. They, you know, they didn't have much construction as part of it. Um, they, uh, you know, Lego tried to listen to its customers, you know, what you're supposed to do. And they came out with a line of toys called Jack Stone, which is kind of this minifigure crossed with G.I. Joe, you know, this, this hero that would save the day. Um, and the, the thing is, they were really built for that, that child that didn't like Lego, you know, which was the majority of kids they found in, from one study. And so they would snap together in about 10 minutes and the kids would start playing. Well, you know, a lot of us as parents, the reason we buy Lego for our kids, we may not admit it to ourselves, but it's that rainy Sunday afternoon. The kids are driving us nuts. We want a couple hours of quiet. And so we get the Lego set. Well, if you bought the Jack Stone set, you'd have 10 minutes and then the kids are running around screaming again. You know, so, so it drove away some of the fans of the brand. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, one of the experiments that Lego did during that time was something called Galador, a huge expensive failure. 
Um, and what it was a, a buildable action figure, which there was a big market for. Um, and what they tried to do is something that we, we uh, suggest here still at, at Wharton um, is to try and do a full spectrum of innovation, a whole set of complementary innovations that will reinforce each other. And so it wasn't just a toy, but it had electronics in it that you could play games in. It had an accompanying video game. It had a TV show that would tell kids the story behind the toy. Um, they did all kinds of marketing, so there would be Galador toys and McDonald's Happy Meals and you know, lots of different innovations that would all build to create this unbeatable offer in the market. Well, they kind of got away from what they knew how to do. Um, the TV show, for example, was so bad, and I looked at this up on IMDb, um, that nobody who ever acted in it acted in anything ever again. Um, it, it destroyed careers. It was, it was just stunningly bad because Lego drove that show and really, you know, didn't know how to do that. Um, it, uh, um, it, it took them a while to figure all this stuff out. Uh, and, and the problem was that they had these successes from um, Star Wars and Harry Potter. But those successes um, were, were really only successful in years in which there was a movie. So there was a Star Wars movie in 99 and 2002. There was a Harry Potter movie in 2001 and 2002. There was no movie from either franchise in 2003 or the first half of 2004. Sales of those two toys fall off a cliff. Lego is left with one profitable product, Bionicle. Everything else is losing money, and Legos, Lego's a fixed-cost business. So if you get above a certain level, then you start making money very fast. If you fall below a certain level, you start losing money very fast. And Lego started losing money very fast in 2003. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean... That would be, I mean, the time that I would think a lot of firms would have completely abandoned an innovation strategy, have said, you know, we don't have the money, we don't have the time to innovate, we have to concentrate on survival. But Lego didn't really do that. And, I mean, what did, why didn't it do that and what did it do instead and where do you think the lesson is there for other firms? Well, they really had no choice. Uh, they had to innovate. I mean, they're in a market which is – you know, vicious global competition, fickle customers, rapidly changing tastes. You, you, if you're in the toy industry, like in many industries, you have to renew your product line every year or two. And so they had no choice but to innovate. But they cut it way back. Um, what they realized is that um, not the, these ideas about how you should innovate, all the things that drove them from 99 to 2003, had drove them out of control, you know, that out-of-the-box thinking almost put them out of business. Um, and what they did after 2003 is they kind of went back in the box. Um, they went back to the brick. And they focused more on the police stations and fire trucks and other things that um, not only that their fans wanted, but were also pretty profitable for them. You know, when they went back in the box, they found that there was a lot of money in the box um, and, uh, and the fans returned to the brand. So the book and Lego story, they seem to some extent to be a cautionary tale about blindly following sort of this textbook map for innovation that a lot of people talk about. But I mean, how do you think companies should use those principles when trying to develop a strategy for themselves? I mean, what should Lego, how should Lego have maybe looked at this at the beginning in order to have a better outcome, at least initially? Yeah, so we, we, um, in the book we talk about the seven truths of innovation or the seven deadly truths because they, were, they almost killed Lego. And the problem is not that they don't work. The problem is that they do, uh, that, that they boosted innovation so much that, uh, that Lego lost control of, of innovation. And so, uh, you know, there's a couple lessons in the book, um, the big one being don't do what Lego did. Right? I mean, don't <laughs> go, almost going out of business, almost going into bankruptcy is marvelous for focusing attention. Um, but it's not really necessary and not, not what we would advise at all in terms of how you should approach this. Um, but instead, you know, what to, what to take away from Lego is that it's not enough just to boost innovation. That as you boost the amount of creativity and, and innovation, You've also got to boost the amount of focus and control. And I think Lego is, the reason I decided to devote a book to the Lego story is I think they are wonderful at achieving that balance between um, giving their people the space to be creative, but the direction and focus to deliver profitable innovation. Um, that the big difference between Lego now versus Lego in 2001 and 2002 is back in 2001, if you were a Lego designer, you'd be told, you know, create a great toy. Do something really cool. Do something that's really going to excite kids. And what you got was, you know, toys that weren't very Lego-y, toys that weren't very profitable, and occasionally a big win. 
Um, now, if you go to work for Lego, it's very likely you'll be told, work on a great police station, work on a great fire truck, give us a great Lego race car. And by the way, don't use any kind of piece or shape that you want, color that you want. Use this very limited palette of, of pieces um, because we can use these pieces in lots of different sets and make them in very high volume and so make a lot of profit as, as, uh, from, from every set that you make. We're, we're going to be pretty much guaranteed of that because we have a, a limited uh, platform that we work from, a, li a limited system of play. Um, and what they found is that a lot of the designers they'd hired in 1999 and 2000 weren't happy with the new Lego. They, they didn't like that narrowing of the freedom. But on the other hand, there were some designers who really liked the fact that, number one, if they were working on a toy, it was very likely that that toy would get into the hands of kids. And number two, they were working for a company that was profitable and growing. And would, you know, th those toys would be around, and that company would be around, and their jobs would be around in a couple of years. So it's, it's a different kind of creativity, and it's a different kind of reward. But I would argue it's just as great a creative challenge. Then, you know, I would say if Even what you're... Even more so, I think. Yeah. Um, if what you're looking for is how to do the next big industry-changing innovation, you know, the next big disruptive innovation or blue ocean innovation, I don't know that Lego's a great model. But on the other hand, if what you're looking for is how to make a lot of money doing lots of small innovations, lots of small ideas, but integrating them really well and focusing them very well on what your customers want and need, then Lego is a great model. And the results show it. I mean, Lego's been growing sales at 24% per year, every year for the past five years, and 40% per year, every profits, growing profits at 40% per year, every year for the last five years. So they're doing something right. Right. Now, it also seems to me, I mean, with this sort of new strategy at Lego, that they're almost, like it seemed like before, in a way, they were almost saying, well, we have this niche of customers, but now we have to get those people who aren't there. But it almost seems now like they've kind of embraced that niche a bit, like making things for the people that are these just very devoted Lego fans who kind of stay that way even after they're adults. Yeah, and, and they, they do. They, they're focusing on their, their niche. Um, but they are moving out. Um, they In the book, we talk about... Um, Lego games, where they moved from the toy shelf to the games shelf uh, pretty successfully and created these games that you build like Lego, and you can rebuild each time you play it. And it comes with directions not just for the first time you play, but the second, third, fourth time. As you snap different faces off the dice and, and put different faces on, the game plays differently each time. Or they just came out with a Lego Friends line, which is Lego for girls mm -hmm. that's been a little controversial, but very successful in terms of bottom line, bottom line profitability. But um, now, one thing you also make the point in the book, that despite this product being pretty ubiquitous, at least for anyone who has kids and probably even a lot of people that don't, that Lego isn't often mentioned in articles about the world's most innovative companies. I mean, it's not a company that immediately comes to mind when there's talk of innovation. Why do you think that is? Oh, you know, I was surprised by that, too, that if you look at Fast Company, which has a list of the most innovative companies, if you look at Business Week, if you look at the Technology Review magazine that comes out of MIT, they have an annual list of the most innovative companies in the world, and Lego has never made the top 50 of any of those lists. But here's a company that's dominating its industry, you know, again, like, like we talked about, with, with vicious global competition, fickle customers, um, and they've lost the patent. The, the patents for the Lego brick were, were issued in 1958 and have all expired. So anybody can Lego, make a Lego brick, and half a dozen companies do and sell it for much less than Lego does. You know, this is a recipe that, you know, our strategy colleagues tell us is a, is a recipe for a bad industry. And yet Lego is making great profits and doing tremendously well doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. And that's another reason why I wanted to tell it in the book is that I think uh, it's, it's this great untold story. Mm -hmm. and now, finally, I mean, you spent a lot of time with Lego executives at Lego headquarters while you're doing this. I mean, what do you think it is about the Lego brick that has kind of made it become just so ubiquitous and such a sort of intrinsic part of a lot of people's childhoods. I mean, what's helped it endure despite the advent of kind of video games and iPads and tablets? And I, I think it's two things. I think there's two reasons why the Lego brick has been so successful. Um, there, there's the point of view from the parents and the point of view from the kids. Um, from the point of view of the kids, I think what Lego learned from Star Wars is the power of the story. 
um, that if you have this rich world with a story that plays out in that world, then kids love to build that world and then play the story out in, in that with their little minifigures and then rebuild it and try things in different ways. And, and, um, and, and Legos learn to tell stories around the bricks, um, I think, very well. Um, from the parents' point of view, I'm convinced that investing in Lego is a great investment in your kid's ability to support you when you're older. And, and so it does teach those creative building skills and those 3D visualization and construction skills that I, I, I think that it clicks a switch in the kids. And even if they move away from the brand, which I think many kids do when they're teenagers, it's not cool to play with Lego, that, that switch stays clicked, and I think it's, it's fundamentally good for kids. Um, and so, as you can imagine, my kids did not suffer from a lack of Lego. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me.